All right, so exam three is done. High was 106. Low was a 21. Average was a 69.6. Hmm? 114. Yes. Final uh, starts Thursday morning and Saturday night. So, again, roughly, I assume there's going to be two ish hours to uh, take it, maybe an hour and a half. I have to see. I, I have an answer. I was asked about how the grades are calculated. Was the third exam actually out of 106 points or just out of 100? And I go through and explain that. So you don't care about your average. So all I look at at the end of the semester is I look at the column that just says total points. So if your grade says 90 out of 106, I just care about the 90. I don't care what it's out of. So don't stress about the, the percent. You're just looking at the column that has the, the total, um, the, like the total number of points. That's what you need to, to figure out your grade. I have no idea because, like, I don't know, math is hard. Um, 500. The percentage on Moodle doesn't matter. The, the, percentage, the percentage on Moodle does not matter. All that matters is the total. So if you've got 270 points and you want a B, you take 380 minus 270, that's 110. And you're like, I need 75 points. I have 75 points left on the homework. And I have 100 points left on the final. These are real words I'm saying, yes. And so if I have a 70 out of 75 on the homework, that means I need a 40 on the final to get my B. So normally I have the homework grades done, but I can't do that and like give you any time to do the homework. So. I know. That's why that's why it was open last week. Hmm? There's five. Mm -hmm. There are three learn smarts and two um, bonus assignments. Yeah. That's the IR and the NMR because I don't think we're gonna get there. Because we are like dreadfully horribly behind. Okay, now, I'm going to write this. So, what does that translate to you? Fifty percent finals from the first three exams. So, what I did is I went through the first three exams on Moodle, and I just picked questions that were already built. I cut their point totals basically in half for almost everything. So, if it was worth two points before, it's worth one point now. So, there are more of them because you're going to have two hours to take the exam, so I assume it should be twice as long. But 50% of the final is literally cut and paste off the first three exams. Hmm? 
the pretest that you took at the beginning that was bonus, 10 points, those 20 questions are now 10 points of the final exam. Before I told you this, I already hid the pretest on Moodle, so you can't just go like, look at that. The first three tests I've not hidden. The thing you took all the way to the beginning, like it's the first thing you did. All right, so you have, in theory, you have the key to half the final. You should get a 50. Yet the number of times in a regular semester that someone, I say that and someone hangs up like a 35. And I'm like, were you even trying? So half the finals in the first three exams, 10 points come from the pretest. The other 40 points are anything I feel like from any point in the semester. Today, tomorrow, or any of the other millions of days before this. Someone just left the Zoom call. They're like, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Three days left. I'm done. He's not going to teach me anything. All right. So, underline that. Uh, so with that, uh, the exam is, I've got 64 points made. I'm going to get it up Thursday morning. As long as you know everything goes to plan, I'll get it up Thursday morning by like 8 a.m. And I'll leave it up Thursday morning, 8 a.m. to Saturday night at 11.59 p.m. That way, if you're traveling somewhere, you can take it before you have to travel where you can take it after you get there, whatever. So in between, if you have a three hour layover somewhere and you trust like airport uh, Wi-Fi with, with, your, with your organic grade, so be it. Okay, so one of the last things we talked about was eliminations and rings. So I was asked how many points the homework is worth. 75. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, on like in Connect? Is it 2,900? Or? So homework plus attendance equals one exam. So attendance is 25, homework is 75. Usually, if you got 100 on the homework, and there was usually one bonus assignment, you could get upwards of like a 78 or a 79 out of 75. Now there are two bonus assignments, so I'm assuming that we are going to get have a, have a, have a higher number than that. So what I'm going to do after you turn in all your assignments, after, you, after all the homework's turned in, homework is due at 11... 59 a.m. So basically noon on Friday. So I have hopefully the afternoon, if the baby allows, to do the homework grade. So I go through and I drop the lowest grade by hand. So if you have two zeros, I find the zero that impacts you the most, the one that's worth the most points, and that's the one I drop. So I go through and I drop everyone's homework, and I calculate your grade that way, and then I enter your grade into Moodle. Hopefully, I can get it done Friday or early Saturday, but no promises. I would do my best. Usually, if it was a regular semester, I would get your homework done like two or three days before you took the final so you knew exactly how much you needed on the final, but we just don't have that luxury. So just assume you need all the points on the final and like try your best. Okay, so we were doing this. <laughs> right. And 
we know that our hydrogen and our bromide are on opposite sides, so we're going to make that as our product. But we can take this like a step further and remember what the chairs or what do uh, cyclohexanes really look like? They look like chairs, right? So what does this look like as a chair? So we've got our chair confirmation. If we say our bromide is this carbon here, will that bromine be axial or equatorial? Axial. Axial is up at this position, right? Our bromine's on a wedge, so it's up. So it needs to be on the axial group. And then what does that make the ethyl group here? Equatorial. Right now, if I do a ring flip, Only one of these confirmations can do an E2 elimination. Right? A can do an E2 elimination. Because what is the rule for doing an E2? You have to have your hydrogen and your leaving group have to be on opposite sides. Right? And only one of them has the hydrogen on the opposite side from the bromide, has it behind the bromide, right? So to do an E2, I don't have space. One sec. I might have to come back. So to do an E2, both your hydrogen and your leaving group need to be axial, right? When they're both axial, that's the only time that they are both going to be on opposite sides from one another. So here, they're on opposite sides. Right? They're anti to one another. When you have the ring flip, they aren't lined up where they are, where the hydrogen is directly behind the bromine. Right? If you think about it, like behind the bromine when you're equatorial, it's kind of kind of in the ring or along one of the bonds. It's not a place where the hydrogen can line up and be behind it. So the only time that you can have your hydrogen and your halogen on opposite sides is when they're both axial. So we had something like this. What's special about Turt Beetle? It's big. It can never be axial, right? It's too big to ever be axial. So that means 
I can never do a ring flip, even if I could do a ring flip. This hydrogen never gets to be eliminated via an E2 reaction, right? I can never flip to put the, the bromine and the hydrogen opposite sides. So we can take this hydrogen here is the only one we can take, right? So if we did an E2 reaction, ooh, that's horrific. We'll pretend this doesn't look terrible, but it kind of looks terrible. I guess a better thing to show, right, would be we could be in a situation where if we have like a tert butyl group where we just can't ever do an E2 elimination, right? So Right? I can't ever make this bromide won't ever become axial because if it's to become axial, my tert butyl group would have to be axial, right? And tert butyl group will never go axial. So So no E2 reaction is possible because no, oops, no ring flip is possible, right? Because the tert butyl group won't ever go axial. So I, won't, I can never put my halide in the axial position. Reasonable? Okay. Okay. So, We've done a lot of reactions with alkyl halides, but I've not told you where alkyl halides come from, right? So we're gonna talk about how the synthesis right, we're gonna talk about the synthesis of alkyl halides. Right, these normally go through some sort of radical halogenation. All right, where your X is either chlorine or bromine and you shine light on it. And ideally, you put your halogen on the most substituted carbon. Right, so if you take Br2 and light, you're going to make one product. It's going to be the Br on the most substituted. I know it's boring, big yawns in here, on the most substituted carbon. If you do the same reaction with chlorine, you're gonna get a mixture of products. Right. So bromine is more selective than chlorine. 
So we're going to talk about why here in a second, but we need to talk about the mechanism first to kind of get all the, all the players involved. Right, so let's use the, the top one for our mechanism. Remember, radical reactions always have three, three parts. Right, you have the initiation. Right here, that's just taking your, ha your halide and shining light on it. That gives enough energy to break the halogen bond and put a radical on each halogen. The propagation step where our products come from. You're going to have your bromine radical pull a hydrogen off and make HBr. And then have that radical react with bromine to make your alkyl bromide plus regenerate your bromine radical. And the last step is termination. This is where you take any two radicals that you have in your reaction and have them run into each other. So you could have two of these run into each other. Make that. You could have two bromines run into each other and make Br2 again. Right? It's just you run two radicals into each other and you make something but you don't regenerate a radical. So our rate determining step in this reaction is right here, is the step that makes the carbon radical. That's our rate determining step. The easier the carbon radical is to form, the faster it forms, right? and the faster the reaction is. So. Right, so the rate determining step is the formation of the carbon radical. The more stable that radical is, the faster the reaction, and the more of that product that you make. Right, so radical stability is follows the same trend as carbocation stability because radicals are a half full orbital. Right, so they're missing an electron. So just like a, rad uh, a carbocation that's missing two electrons, a radical is missing one electron. So it follows the same kind of trend because they're both carbon species that are short electrons. So the most stable radical is tertiary's most stable. Then secondary then primary, then methyl. Kind of like carbocations, we kind of limit ourselves to 
we can make these. It's different as primaries are a, a sometimes food. Right, if you have a very particular reactive uh, radical species, you can make primaries. I now regret my color choices. It should have been green, then the yellowy color, then red, but I kind of flipped it around. Sorry. Would have been a perfect stoplight, but just didn't think about it until I was too far in. I was in too deep. Okay. So, when you use bromine, bromine always tries to take the hydrogen from the most substituted carbon because it makes the most substituted radical, which is the most stable. So when you have something like this, Br2 and light, bromine is going to try to make the most stable radical that it can. So it's going to make the tertiary radical, which is going to lead to the tertiary bromide, right? So All right, so bromine radical always makes the most stable, I should specify, carbon. Carbon radical. Right, so it's going to be selective and look for the hydrogen to remove that is going to lead to the most stable radical. Chlorine reacts with whatever hydrogen it runs into first, right? So there are four different types of hydrogens in this molecule. It is going to run, whatever one it runs into first is the one it's going to react with first. You can predict how your product ratio is based on how many hydrogens are there of that type. And there's like some math to do. But in general, chlorine just kind of makes a mess. So I kind of think of it like this. I use a dating analogy or like at the bar, right? Chlorine is that guy at the coop who's drunk at two and doesn't want to go home alone. And just everyone that walks by, he's like, you're pretty. Want to go home with me? And just... It's just hoping that someone says yes. There's no selectivity there. It's just whoever says yes first, you've made his day, right? Bromine is a classy lady. She wants to know like what your plans are for the future. Do you have a job now? What kind of car do you drive? What's your GPA? She has questions before things are gonna go anywhere. She's gonna pick the very best person or in this case, hydrogen to hang out with. Chlorine, chlorine's just like at the end of the bar, simultaneously sli swiping right on everyone on Twitter, Tinder. I think it's right. Right's the good way, right? I don't know. Swiping right on everyone on Tinder while asking everyone with a pulse that walks by, how you doing, right? And so there's no selectivity. It's whoever says yes first, whatever hydrogen says yes to chlorine first, he's like, woohoo. Right. So for the most part, the examples I'm going to use in class or on an exam are gonna be bromine because they're way it's way easy to predict what bromine is going to do. You know that bromine's gonna look at the molecule and go like, okay, which one of you is most stable? That's the one I wanna react with.
Okay. So you can just look at a molecule. And all you're trying to do is you're trying to find the most, the, the basically you're trying to find the tertiary carbon, right? And you're like, okay, I've got one tertiary carbon, means I'm gonna have one product very straightforward. There's chlorine, it's just you're just gonna get a mess of different things. Every carbon's gonna get a chlorine. Yeah. The yes, the Oprah of halogens. Everybody gets a chlorine. Now I've gotta cut that into this video. There we go. Thanks. Just pick anything. Mm. You would have thought all of the above would be the easy one, right? Am I a better streamer than Pokemon, Ninja, or Dr. Disrespect, or all of the above? People got it wrong. People were like, he's clearly just Dr. Disrespect. Not, not, not better than these other two. And I'm like, what the hell? That was, all of the answers there were right. I gave 100% on all of them. So we can also brominate allylic or benzylic carbons. So right, this is benzylic. And this is allylic. Right. So, so a six-membered aromatic ring is called benzene. So benzylic is just the height, the carbon beside a benzene ring, All right? And these are able to, again, Br2 is gonna rather, would rather put the hydrogen beside a benzene ring. Here it doesn't have a choice, right? We're gonna put the bromine beside the benzene ring. Or here, you're going to put it beside the double bond. Like you prefer, it prefers to put them beside the aromatic ring or the double bond. So if you had, well, let's slightly different conditions. I know, it's not super pleasing, but. This is the where we live in. So let's say you had a, an aromatic ring and you had two secondary carbons, right? I've got a secondary carbon here, secondary and benzylic. And I've got a secondary carbon here. Right? You have to pick only one. The bromine will react with the benzylic carbon first to make this product. I don't know why it's blue, let's fix that. All right, so the benzylic radical this radical here, more stable than this radical here. They're both secondary, but the benzylic radical, just like it were a benzylic carbocation, I can move that through the aromatic ring with resonance. So I can spread that radical out 
across the carbons of the ring as opposed to just having it stuck on one carbon, right? The more resonant structures you can draw for a molecule, the more stable that molecule is, or in this case, radical. So, right, you can see that I have I can move that radical around my ring. Right, so when you have it be benzylic, you give it more resonant structures and it's able to move around the ring. So you're going to select a benzylic secondary carbon over a just a secondary carbon because you have resonance. Same as if I had two tertiary carbons, you'd pick the benzylic one over the not benzylic. Oh, you do notice, I should point this out, the arrows I'm using are the fish hook arrows because I'm only moving one electron, right? If I was moving an anion or a carbocation, I'd be using the double-headed arrows, but here I'm just showing the movement of one electron. So, right, the radical here, that electron comes over, and then one electron from the double bond comes over to meet it to make the new double bond. So you're just using the fish hook arrows all the way around. Right, if you have, right, same thing with, if you have an allylic, oops. Carbon is the same deal, but just less resonant structures. You're gonna choose the secondary allylic. versus just the secondary, because again, making that allylic radical leads to more resonant structures. So I'm gonna make this product over the other one because I get So the secondary allylic uh, radical is more stable than just the secondary radical. Okay, I have to go to another slide to do this because I don't have one to draw. Right, I can move that radical around a little bit. So now I spread that radical out across two carbons as opposed to just having it stuck on one. So that makes it more stable. So we can use Br2 to do this, or there's another reagent that is a kind of kinder, gentler bromine, snuggly bromine, I guess. Right, so for Allylic. Or tertiary carbons. NBS can be used. So bromine's kind of gross, right? It's just like orangey red liquid. And like whenever you open the bottle, there's this like orangey red smoke of bromine that comes out of it. 
not exactly the best thing for you. NBS is this. You have this weak nitrogen bromine bond that when you shine light on it, it breaks and generates a bromine radical and a nitrogen radical. So this you can, instead of basically you can just replace Br2 with MBS if you're going to make a tertiary allylic or benzylic bromide. Right, so NBS specifically only reacts at tertiary benzylic or allylic, so it also helps your selectivity, right? So NBS, there's all these like nice, happy secondary carbons you could remove hydrogens from, but NBS only can react at a tertiary carbon, so you're only going to get one product, which is where you're going to make the tertiary bromide. Here, the next one, I have two benzylic carbons, blue dot and green dot, but only one of them has hydrogens, right? For me to put, to do a bromination, I'm replacing a hydrogen with a bromine. So I have to have a hydrogen that I can replace. So here I'm going to make that product. So benzenes, since there's all those double bonds, it's flat. There's no ring to it. So benzenes are like all those double bonds are in the same plane. So there's no like three dimensional shape. It's just a flat disc. It has a trait beetle grip sticking straight off. Talk about the stereochemistry of this real quick. You always end up making racemic halides because radicals are flat, just like carbocations. Right. So you have your carbocations, they're flat, radicals are flat as well. So when you have, you know, your Br2 and light and you make this, right, you are making a chiral carbon, technically, right? But You have a 50% chance that your bromine attacks the top side of the orbital and a 50% chance that your bromine attacks the bottom side of that orbital. So half the time, you're going to make this product. And the other half the time, you're going to come from the bottom. You're going to make that product.
So you're going to make two different products. And so you just don't end up ever like with any stereochemistry that gets conveyed because you just always lose that chiral center. So even if you had, right, they're kind of like an SM1 reaction, even if you had a situation where you had a, a chiral center to start with, you would have no stereochemistry at the end because it would it goes away. Your radical is flat and you lose any stereochemistry you have any recollection of. Okay, so we're going to do Williamson ether synthesis on Wednesday. And I'm going to see how far into IR I can get in the remaining time. But it is what it is. So when you're looking at the old exams and you see a question that is like NMR and you're like, Defuk, <laughs> we haven't covered it. So even though you covered it in lab, kind of, I'm not going to put it on the test because there's no way in hell we're going to get to NMR on Wednesday. So I will know how much IR I taught you. So that will dictate how much, if any, IR is on the exam. But you know, I know what I've taught you. So no way NMR is going to be there. There might be some IR. We'll see where we get on Wednesday. So with that, I will see you guys on Wednesday.